Hey folks, Dave Temple here. As you know, my podcast is all about talking to some of the best thriller writers in the world. But now, after nearly two and a half years, I think it's time I toot my own horn. So with that, I'm offering my thriller, The Poser, for sale. This thriller stars Hollywood detective Patricia Pat Norelli, a rookie cop working the overnight beat when one of Hollywood's biggest stars is found dead in her Hollywood Hills home. The only problem, the star just won an Oscar and is found dead only hours later. Now, Pat sees this as a way to forge her own path and muscles her way into the case. Soon, she and partner Detective Stuart Brown find themselves deep inside a complex case with more questions than answers and a ghost of a killer. Now, this isn't my first self-published book, but it's the first one I'm very confident you're going to like. I'm pretty proud of it. And for the rest of this month, you can get the ebook for only $5.95 or the paperback for $13.95. Now, since I do this weekly podcast as a free service, perhaps you'd consider this a way to help out your fellow thriller author. Okay, here's the link davidtemplebooks.com slash books okay there you'll see the poser just click and you're on your way again the link is davidtemplebooks.com slash books otherwise just head over to amazon okay thanks for your support and now on with the show Hello and welcome to yet another edition of The Thriller Zone. I'm your host, David Temple. And on today's show, I've got a really special guest. I know you're saying to me, Dave, you say special every time. They're all special to me, okay? They're hanging out with me. Pinion Scorpion and the Barbershop Detectives is written by Rick Blyweiss. And he is our guest today. And I got to tell you something. Yes, this book is gorgeous. Yes, the book is a sensational read, especially for a first-time novelist, which you're going to hear about in a second. But this guy is a former entertainment exec with many, many years in the music business, which is why I got particularly excited to have him on the show. So we're getting a double dose of awesomeness. (laughs) Thanks for joining me. Now, join us as we get into Thriller Zone. Rick. David, how are you? I'm so good. How are you, sir? I'm fine, thank you. (laughs) Let me make sure I'm pronouncing your last name, because I would hate to go through the whole show and screw that up. (laughs) It's Blyweiss, right? That's exactly right. Oh, thank God. My parents will be so proud my education done me good. Yes, it did. Great. (laughs) So is this a video or audio only, or, or what What are we doing? It's everything. Good. It's a, It's everything you want it to be. <laughs> <laughs> that works. That works for me. Yeah, no, we're, uh, I'm, I'm one of those guys that uh, believes in capitalizing on all this great technology we have. So we're going to have a podcast over here on all your podcast channels and over on the YouTube channel so we can see that lovely face of yours. I don't know that I'd put it that way, but that's great. <laughs> handsome, handsome. Can we go with that? Either, you know, they, they're they all very flattering. I don't know how true any of them are, but that's okay. <laughs> well, uh, you have the single most handsome backdrop of, I think, maybe I've seen yet, at least the most impressive. These have got to be record deals that you've uh, had your hand on one time or another? Uh, yeah, they're uh, more than deals. They're... Uh, artists that uh, I've marketed or promoted or, you know, just been involved with their records and their careers in one manner or another. And uh, also film soundtracks. I did a lot of film soundtrack marketing. Okay. Well, we are going to have a blast. We are going to get to this book, which is gorgeous on so many levels. Pinon Scorpion and the Barbershop Detectives. We're going to get to this, but uh, having come from a music background and uh, the entertainment business, when I got uh, some of your press release, I'm like, oh, I cannot wait to talk to Rick because he's going to have a world of stories. So first of all, thank you and welcome to the Thriller Zone. Thank you. Glad to be here. So, uh, let's, let's, can, if, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure some of these questions have been asked, but, uh, you're brand, you're brand new to me and I treat every single show like it's the only show I will ever do. So I hope that's cool with you. Absolutely. Yeah. I Absolutely. always figure <laughs> you, you, you can't go wrong if, if, I mean, you're the star and, uh, I'm excited about this 
possibility for you for so many reasons. Because, ladies and gentlemen, here's a guy who was going down this track and at a a later point in life decided, I want to go down this track. And this is going to be, I know it's going to be one of my favorite stories ever. So, Well, thanks. I hope I don't disappoint. You're not. uh, Just showing up. Thank you. Hey, and speaking of which... um, I had another music industry icon on the show last week, uh, Paul Vidic, talking about uh, his music background and uh, dealing with Apple music and so forth. So it's really cool to be able to have two guys in a row, roughly, um, with your kind of background. Um, I mean, is it true? Did I read this right? I mean, please tell me. Melissa Etheridge and Backstreet Boys, you actually launched these careers? I, I was, I, I mean, I didn't do it alone, but I was very instrumental with both of those acts. Um, yeah, I, uh, a funny story, <clears throat> story. I, um, I uh, was hired at Island Records um, to be head of sales, uh, senior VP of sales. And um, the GM, Bill Berger, uh, hands me a stack of CDs uh, the day that I started. And he said, I want you to take these home and listen to them. And I want you to come back and tell me which one you think one or two we should chase. Wow. Okay. Because he said, we've just got too many of them to prioritize all of them. That was an unfortunate thing of the entire music industry, of course. You couldn't, you know, put the same effort behind every single record you put out. So, you know, Bill's going, let's choose them. So I go home, I listen to them. I come back the next morning and I said, well, Bill, there's two of them that I really like. And I, I, I honestly, David, don't remember what the second one was. It's immaterial to the story. <laughs> and I said, but the one that I like the best is this Melissa Etheridge. And at this point, M- Melissa's CD had been out just a very short period of time. The first track, similar features had come out, but you know, it was like Midland, not doing phenomenally well yet. And um, Bill said to me, I know why I hired you. You're absolutely right. That's what I was hoping you would say. And so Bill and I and the the promotion team and my sales team uh, got together and we formulated a plan of going and doing a lot of in-stores, a lot of uh, small concerts with her. In fact, the first time I ever saw Melissa in concert was standing, playing on the floor of the gymnasium at Nassau Community College, you know, <laughs> Long Island. You know, I mean, not exactly a glamor show. Um, and the promotion guys, you know, we had a plan of how we were gonna execute this. And um, it, it just, it, it really worked. And, and our distributor at the time, we uh, Warner Electra Atlantic Distribution, they just were into her too. So, I mean, we just all rallied and, and, you know, kind of Bill and I and the head of promotion put the whole plan together and then carried it through. And um, I'll tell you a funny story about Melissa. I'm uh, So, you know, I keep reporting to her and meeting her in the band uh, backstage at concerts and, you know, reporting you know, well, we just passed 100,000 sales on the album. And, you know, I, I was Bring Me Some Water was the second one. And that started exploding. And, um, you know, I kept telling her. And then the album went gold. It hit a half a million. And Melissa didn't know it. So the president of Islands, Guy Lou Malia, who's a phenomenal character. Unfortunately, he's passed away. But he was a fabulous record man in person. Uh, Lou comes to me and goes, Well, the album just went gold, which you well know. We want to present Melissa with a gold record plaque. I said, great. He goes, I want you to do it. So I said, okay, I'll be happy to. So he said, here's what we're doing. We're flying you out to LA, because I was New York based, the company was, flying you out to LA and Melissa is taping a VH1 special. I think it was at the Whiskey A Go-Go, but I don't remember. I think that's where it was. He said, and I've arranged with VH1 that you're gonna go up on stage during one of, in between one of her performances and present her the plaque and she's not gonna know what's going on. Oh my God. So this happens, I get there, I'm I'm holding the plaque behind my back. She does a performance and then the the H1 guys say to me, okay, go up there and do it now. So I'm walking up with the plaque behind my back 
And Melissa's looking at, at, in the other direction. She turns around, looks at me. She like does a double take and she goes, what are you doing on my stage? <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I quickly whip out the plaque and I go, well, Melissa, you know, we just went. And, and of course, she forgave me for being on her stage at that point. Wow. <laughs> but that, that was kind of like a cool incident in my life. The Backstreet Boys was an interesting story, if you don't mind me telling it. Please, I ask, yes. And, but, you know, uh, uh, Jive Records was their label, and I was head of marketing for their distributor, BMG Distribution. And, um, but I was always a very good marketing head, if you will. And so they called me in and said, um, well, they, they had the boys perform at a BMG convention before they were ever known. They weren't dancing. They were just sitting there in street clothes singing. And I, I just thought they were very cool. I thought it was, you know, like this is kind of a boys to men kind of vibe here. Yep. Um, and so it, they, we put out the first single. It didn't do very much. So the guys at Jive called me and said, do you have any ideas, maybe some different ways that we could break them? So I came back a week later and I said, I've come up with two ideas. And, and these are things that we ended up doing. And the first one was, I said, I think what we should do is bring them to Europe. Their sound is much more European than the United States at this point. Let's bring them there. Let's make them superstars in Europe and bring them back to the States like the Beatles. We'll, we'll hire girls to meet them at the airport and scream for them. <laughs> we, by the way, we didn't have to hire the girls by the time they came back. Right. They were already being screamed at. Um, and that's exactly what we did. Um, and that worked. And then I said, so now here's the other thing. At that point in history, Walmart had, was selling music, but it wasn't one of their key categories. But we knew they wanted to be better known for selling music. So I said, why don't we go to Walmart and ask them to be Backstreet Boys headquarters and make a special disc for them, uh, have them do banners, have them promote it. Let, they've never done something like that before. Yeah. So, so we went to the people who, they were called rack jobbers. They're the people that put the music into, you know, the CDs, into, into uh, Walmart. You had to go through them. We went to them and they said, what a great idea, but we want to see the boys and we want to videotape them so we can show the Walmart people how good they are and how clean they are. Because clean image was important. Yeah. So we all fly to Switzerland to a concert that the boys were doing, a Christmas concert in Switzerland at an ice skating rink. And I will tell you that we started filming five hours before the concert. The girls were outside screaming and lined up. It was like a stampede going in. During the entire show, girls are fainting. They're being lifted and hoisted out of the crowd. You know, I had never seen that before. Okay, maybe right. with new kids or, you know, I had never seen it before. Well, to make a long story short, we, we go to, they go to Walmart and Walmart says, okay, we'll, we'll do this. And that's how we launched the Backstreet Boys. Wow. Now, they had to have talent. They did. But we just found a different way to launch them. Well, isn't that kind of the, I mean, it's, it's like you writing books. It's like anybody who, you know, you can get all the publicity you want. But if you don't have the talent to back it up, people will see through that very quickly. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you for that story. That's an amazing story. And, you know, uh, folks, by the way, let's rattle off a few more that uh, Rick has dealt with. A little known gal named Whitney Houston, you know, Britney Spears, U2, Pink, The Village People, Bee Gees. I mean, what in the world was that like? Uh, for, for those of us, um, I've got a couple little close uh, rubs with uh, famous folks, but, you know, for the average bear to hang out with these, to be able to help launch this caliber of talent, what is that like for you? Well, I, I, to be perfectly honest, I didn't necessarily launch all of those. I mean, some of those acts, I came in after they already had been successful and I hopefully did my part to make them even more successful or keep them successful. Some of them, you know, I, I like the boys and Melissa, I did help launch. 
Um, but you it, had degrees of separation that help push them along. I mean, yes. you had more than just a casual, hey, how are you guys? Yeah. 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 And, and I was closer to some of these acts than others. I mean, some act, I, I met virtually every act. In fact, every act you mentioned, I've met. Right. And, you know, um, some though I, I, was, I was closer with. I mean, one act that you didn't mention who I was pretty close with was Kiss. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, uh, I, I will tell you, it was funny because I uh, I started, uh, I first met Kiss, I believe it was during, uh, right before their Destroyer album, which had I Was Made For Loving You on it. Yeah. And um, I was asked to put together a marketing plan for that album. And I, I go to uh, Kiss's manager, Bill LaCoyne's office, and Gene Simmons is there. I was knew that Gene was going to be there. And I went to present the marketing plan of the record company and, and um, Gene says, listen, before you do that, if you don't mind, I come up with a few ideas. Can I run them by you? And I said, absolutely. Well, I wrote a really good marketing plan. Gene wrote a better one. Uh, <laughs> I mean, he was a marketing genius and, uh, we, we, we became friends. I mean, I, funny story when they, they were still in paint, you know, I mean, they, oh, they yeah. weren't seen that, you know, they were, they were all very, very, um, secretive about what they looked like they didn't want anybody seeing them so i get a call one day and gene goes listen you you want to be my date for a donick summer concert at forest hills he goes sure i mean that's great arm candy for me sure so, <laughs> so we go and I, I expect that i'm going to be sitting next to gene well I, i'm not he he bought the seat in front of his for me so that i could be on the lookout for anybody, any paparazzi in the crowd that might recognize him and want to take his picture out of face paint, which I, I understood. But the entire concert, he's like looking down, tugging on my shoulder and going, does anybody recognize me? Well, nobody recognized him because nobody knew what he looked like. <laughs> anyway, it, you know, um, it, it was fun. It, you yeah. know, look, I, I have a life I would not trade for anything. You yeah. know, I, it, it's just been a, a phenomenal. I, I got to market the soundtrack to Saturday Night Fever. I got to market the soundtrack to Star Wars, Flashdance, Grease. You know, I mean, I saw all these movies before they came out, Chariots of Fire. I just had a great time. I was there in the beginning of rap. I remember that one of our a &R guys came to me with this act, Curtis Blow, who was one of the very earliest rap guys. Yeah. And he uh, he played me Curtis Blow. I think it was The Breaks was the first one. And I said, I don't totally understand this, but if you tell me you know, that this is going to be big, um, let's go for it. And he said, I'm telling you, this is going to be big. And he said, the people who own this company, they don't get it but I do. So let's make it happen. And we did. Wow. See, this is having spent 25 years in radio, this, this, I could sit here and talk to you about this all day long because I love the music business. I love the whole, oh, the whole environment. And, uh, if not to try to top you, but I, I remember two tiny little moments. Uh, I was doing a morning show in New York and, um, they were getting ready to release two acts and uh, head of uh, A&R uh, sent us, flew us down to Nashville, said, we're going to release these two. We want to hear what you think, because if you like them, you're going to be playing their music on Monday morning. One was Keith Urban and the other was Rascal Flatts. <laughs> two good acts. <laughs> and I remember meeting them and they couldn't have been nicer. Rascal Flatts are probably some of the funniest guys I've ever met in my life. And I remember being in that moment. I remember that out of body experience of like, I think I'm on the edge of something really huge. So I'm going to be completely present. And it was, you know, and you had this every, practically every single day. So, wow. It, it, and it's not, it's not star. Um, there's a word for it that I won't use, but it's not being completely overwhelmed by the star factor. It's, this is what it is. It's being in proximity to someone who has spent their entire life chasing a dream. And finally that moment materializes and they're ready for launch. And to see that happen is one of the most exhilarating things ever. Absolutely. Although I, I had a, a slightly different experience than many uh, record company executives in that I spent, uh, before I became a record company executive, I was a musician, I was a touring musician, a recording musician, a recorded songwriter, 
you know, and so I brought a, a little different perspective to it because one of the things I always told my staff was, I would always want to treat the acts that we deal with the way I would want it, would want it to have been treated were I the act because I sat on both sides of the desk and I knew what it was like. And you know, record companies put out a lot of records. Acts only had that one record. It was their life. It wasn't just their product. It was their life. Yeah. Yeah. That is such an exceptional point. And it's so true. And, you know, to be there on the, on the cutting edge and, 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 and back to that point of like, you, you spend your whole life working toward that dream and you know that you're just within a, a hair of either making it or breaking it, you know, and wow. Uh, I'm, okay, go ahead. No, no, I was going to say, how do you think that past experience? Cause I'm, I'm just trying to think, I'm trying to put myself in your place, you know, and I know it's business. This isn't just about, Hey, we're listening to great music. I, I, I get that. But how do you think that past experience in the music business prepared you for this now next chapter, uh, becoming a chart topping published author? Well, okay. Um, I, I've got to take you back to when I was 12 years old. Okay. Okay. When I was 12 years old, I was uh, playing rock and roll. And that was in 1956 when rock and roll was just starting. But I, as soon as I heard rock and roll, I, I was addicted. And I, I wasn't, you know, playing the guitar already. My parents had me learning the guitar, which I wanted from about when I was eight. So, you know, I was already into it. And I was writing songs already. But when I was 12 years old, I also wrote and published a sports newspaper that I made four Xerox copies of, or they were mimeographs at that point, or carbon copies, yeah. and sold to my four closest neighbors. So I, I was doing that. So through my entire high school and college years, I was playing in bands, writing songs, recording. And at the same time, I was, uh, I was, I wrote a play in high in college. I was a film major, so I was writing scripts to the student films that I was making. I was always writing. Over the course of my career um, in the music industry, I still wrote. I wrote newspaper columns. I wrote articles for magazines. I always loved writing. Um, some of it was songs and some of it was not songs. I contributed chapters to nonfiction books, one on the world music, another one on your first kiss. You know, I mean, just interesting stuff to just hone what I was doing. So I always liked writing. And if you don't mind another instant, I'll take you back to um, late 60s. Uh, I co-wrote a science fiction rock opera with a bandmate of mine. <laughs> and I, I was, I was pretty gutsy, and I went out and I got a man named Sid Bernstein to manage it. Uh, Sid is the man who brought the Beatles and the Stones to the United States. He was a big entrepreneur in the music industry. Yeah. Sid fell in love with the rock opera and got Leonard Bernstein's producer John McClure to produce demos of it. And John had been producing the New York Rock and Roll Ensemble at the time, and he got them to actually play the tracks. So we've got this great demo, we've got the script of the rock opera, and Sid goes out to try to sell it. And one of the people who really, really was interested in it <clears throat> was Robert Stigwood. And Stigwood, for any of your listeners, viewers who don't know who he was, was a real impresario. He not only was the manager of the Bee Gees and found and managed Eric Clapton. He had RSO Records, he produced Hair, he produced Jesus Christ Superstar, um, Saturday Night Fever. I mean, he was, he was a big to do. And Sid came to us and said, Robert's interested, but he's got another rock opera that he's very interested in. And he's really only got the capacity right now to do one of them. And we'll find out next week which one he's going to do. Well, the next week he chose the other one. And the other one was a Vita. Oh. <laughs> well, you were in good competition, right? I know. 
So anyway, uh, and I, by the way, I am uh, in the process of rewriting and re-recording uh, parts of the rock opera because I think it's as viable today as it is ever because it's about uh, oppression and it's about uh, invasion by uh, a, a galactic overlord, which is kind of a parallel to what's going on in parts of the world today. Um, but anyway, that aside, um, so I retired from the music industry in 2002, moved from New York City to Ashland, Oregon, where I live now. And I got bored out of my mind in <laughs> retirement. <laughs> I joined the board of directors of the Shake Oregon Shakespeare Festival, the Ashland Film Festival, the local university. I mean, I needed to keep my mind active and I needed to uh, use the skills that I had built up. And uh, shortly after I moved here, my next door neighbor came to me and said, you told me you, uh, you, you wrote, you've written in your life. I went, yeah. And she said, I'm in a writer's group. We have poets, we have write, fiction writers, nonfiction writers, short story writers. Why don't you join us? Maybe, maybe you would enjoy writing something and, and being part of the group. I said, sure, why not? I, I try most anything in life if it's legal. Um, <laughs> and so I joined the group. And I, it started my creative juices flowing, if you will. And the Pinion Scorpion actually started as a short story that I wrote for that group and or while I was in the group. And I didn't have a name for the character. And they just said to me, wow, this is, this is really good. You need to turn this into a book. And so over the course of on and off the next five years, I turned it into a book. <laughs> well, then that's perfect, a tee up for this. Um, you made me think of an idea that I wanted to ask you, but I'm gonna push it down the, uh, the conversation because uh, <clears throat> it's gonna be better placed later. But one quick thing about this, and, and, and my listeners know I geek out over covers. Um, I think I just love the craftsmanship and I've never, I shared this with my wife the other day. I said, have you ever seen a book quite like this between the, the double treatment on the cover with the mat and the gloss and the emboss and then the, the quality of the paper? I mean, this is like a collector's edition, Rick, how in the world did you create such a gorgeous, and this is your first book out of the gate, really? I mean... Tell me about that. I, I will be happy to because I'm not going to take credit for anything other than saying it looks great. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm published by Blackstone Publishing, uh, well, Publishing and Audio, mm -hmm. who published the book. They have what I consider to be one of the single best creative art departments in, in publishing today. And the, the woman, Catherine English, who created the cover, I, I just... I can't say enough about how talented she is and how great I agree with you this cover is. And then the CEO, Josh Stanton of the company, he believes that one of the hallmarks that Blackstone needs to be known by is quality. And it's, it's Josh that personally said, let's do the raised printing, let's do this quality. But we try to do this on every book pub that Blackstone publishes. And, and, I just can say I'm fortunate that it's published by a company that, that cares. Yeah, I mean, I, and I don't want to belabor the point, but I'm going to for just a second. I mean, I, I've got a mountain of books, a mountain of books uh, in this room right now. And, uh, you know, a lot of times ARCs, uh, advanced reader copies, are a uh, cheaper quality because they're still in process. But I have yet, of all the books I've got, there's nothing quite like this book. And you really do walk away going, I've got a, I've got a collector's edition. And you want to almost, and I don't know if this is the geek in me, Rick, but you want to reverentially be careful. You know, you, and I tend to make notes in my book, but I wouldn't in this one. Oh, wow. This is just, anyway, it's gorgeous. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. I do want to talk about, it's funny, my, my wife saw this and she goes, is it as a children's book? Because at first you like, because it's playful and it's, it's right. uh, there's a, there's another word for it that I can, well, my favorite word of this book, and it's, you can sum it all up, is the nostalgia. 
And it's the nostalgia that I felt the very first sentence. And um, I want to talk about this. I mean, how, first of all, I'm so geeked out here. I'm hard to keep up. Where did you come up with, and I am saying that, Pinon Scorpion? Yes, you're saying it perfectly well. <laughs> Where in the world? It reminds me of uh, Hercule Poirot, which has always been hard for me to say, but where'd you come up with that? Okay, I'm, I'm glad you asked. And, and it's interesting that you uh, said Poirot because um, I, I came up with the character and I didn't have a name for the character. And I, and I have been my whole life a fan of Sherlock Holmes, Hercule Poirot, you know, uh, Nero Wolf. These are all characters that did not have your everyday run of the mill name. Yes. They're, and so I'm, I said to myself, I want to create a name for this character that isn't going to be run of the mill. Now, I, I write in, in the way, the way that I write is. Okay, let me stop Rick right there. I want to know exactly what his method is. You would too, right? So let's take a short break. And when we come back, we're going to find out Rick Blyweiss's magical solution or formula, if you will, to how he writes a novel. We'll be back with more right after this on The Thriller Zone. Are you a traditional published author? Maybe you're a self-published author. Maybe you're thinking about becoming one or the other. But you're a writer and you know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, a couple of things. A book cover. People do judge it. And a website. You got to have a book cover that really sings or people might not pick up and even give your book a chance. Kind of the same thing with a website. Yes, you can go with other companies. Some of them have no control, small control. A lot of them are um, less than super professional. But there's a group I have been introduced to called authorbytes.com. They're great guys. When it was time for me to decide, hey, you know what? I'm going to get serious about this, and I, I need a website that is built by some professionals. Oh, that's, by the way, protected by professionals, because if your website's built on, say, WordPress like mine, it can run into some problems. But these guys take care of all those problems. Authorbytes.com. Check them out. And by the way, if today you use the promo code, the Thriller Zone, they're going to give you not one, not two, Three months free hosting with a one-year contract. So the next time you say to yourself, I went to this website and it was super cool. It could have been Mark Graney, Brad Taylor, Paul Vidic. You know, there's a lot of guys out there who uh, are beginning, some that are hitting at the top. Author Bites takes them all on as they're, they're the only customer they have. That's kind of one of the things I like about them. Customization, security, and just a pleasure to work with. Check him out at authorbytes.com. Tell him David Temple sent you. And use promo code the Thriller Zone. Hi, I'm Rick Blyweiss, and I am the author of Pinion Scorpion and the Barbershop Detectives. And I'm here and thrilled to be here with David Temple and on the Thriller Zone. And now back to the show. The way that I write is I see the book play as a movie in my head, and my job is to type it and capture what I'm seeing. I don't plot things I don't in advance. I don't bullet point things. I don't use cards. I just see it, and I, and I write it. Okay, well, let me hold you right there. Uh, I, I, I see similarly, but you're telling me you sit down. It's almost like you're transcribing a movie that pours into your head, right? Exactly, Yes. So exactly. no outline, you're a complete pantser? Yes, total, complete pantser. Wow. I do go back after I've written things and I go back and I fine tune them. I may add a red herring here or there, or, but yes, the, the book I write is a total pantser. Um, so I, it came to me that this character was going to have a heritage where his father was Egyptian and his mother was Haitian. I can't tell you why, it was just <laughs> in my head, okay? So I go, well, then he's gotta have names that reflect that heritage. Sure. So the first thing I did was look for a family surname, a family name uh, for him. 
And so I started researching Egyptian and Arabic last names. And I came upon this name, Scorpion. And I liked it for two reasons. One reason was it was very similar to Scorpion. Yes. So it, it was familiar. It wasn't like a totally foreign sounding name. And the second thing is what it stood for in its native language was entrepreneurship and, and assertiveness and um, creativity. And that described his father as I described his father in the book. So I thought that's great. So then I go, let me get a first name that works with this last name. So then I started researching Haiti where his mother uh, came from. And I found that a, the first European explorer to Haiti um, in a certain region of Haiti was uh, a man whose last name was Pignon. And they, they named a town and a mountain after him. So I postulated in the book that the, the mother lived in Pignon, Haiti, and that's where the father and the mother met and married and conceived their child. So why not ceremoniously name him after that? And I love the way Pignon and Scorpion worked together. Yeah. That's how the name came about. Thank you for sharing that. And I'm telling you something. <clears throat> It is one of those names that you will never forget. And that, well, there's your marketing uh, experience coming to play. And I'm gonna be, go back and revisit this statement because uh, what, what I loved the most about this was going back to a simpler time. And I'm not sure, and I'm a thriller writer and I like thrillers and I like things probably a little bit darker for, than if right. for my own good. So I'm not, I'm not sure if it's because I've been watching too much murder and mayhem uh, <laughs> when my wife and I find myself ourselves spending countless hours watching uh, all creatures great and small. But, I love that. Yep. Yeah. So when you when you go from Killing Eve on A and E uh, and Dexter on uh, HBO, and all of a sudden now you're sitting with uh, PBS and you're watching All Creatures Great and Small, where uh, as I love to joke, the most serious thing is, will the calf be birthed safely? Right. <laughs> exactly. You know, um, and that's what I was loving about this is just the fact that, um, and I think we're missing that today. And and it it really does beg the question, could we stand a little bit more of this? And I say with a resounding yes. Well, thank you. And, you know, I, I wrote it purposefully that way. You know, I, I mean, I, um, if, if you do go back to the books of, of Holmes and Agatha Christie and, you know, et cetera, they weren't very gory, you know, they, mm -hmm. they and so I, I just thought, let me try to take my shot at recreating the language and the style and the feel of that era and sort of like combine a, a classic whodunit with a cozy mystery, if you will. And um, I think one of the things I'm very, very pleased about is that, you know, we live in a very, very stressful world right now in real life. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of people who have read the book have commented how while they were reading the book, it de-stressed them and it took them away from, and took them back to a kinder, gentler Downton Abbey era. And I'm just very pleased that I've been able to help people in that way. 100%. And, uh, you know, again, this is a thriller show. But uh, when I ran across this opportunity to talk to you, I, I said, because really, at the end of the day, I just love talking to people who are really, truly interesting and who are living their life's passions. So that kind of takes precedence over a little thing, uh, you know, but it's a lot easier to just approach it that way than going, hey, welcome to the thriller mystery, sometimes cozy and often comedic zone, you know? <laughs> Yeah, well, no, I get it. But yeah. just to be fair with your, your viewers, uh, there are three crimes in the book. There's a yeah. fortune seeker, there's a crime of passion and a murder at a circus. So it's, you know, it's got humor in it. It's got colorful, but it's a mystery, first and foremost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so you kind of just answered my question. I was going to say, oh, and why did you pick the early 1900s in a small English village? But I, I can see because that is, it, it's so representative of a simpler, kinder time. Yeah, and I, I also spent uh, 
time in, in England. I haven't lived there, but I've been there many, many times, including the countryside where this takes place. And I, I just, I, I love the country. I love the era. I, I even was uh, in a castle and I, I won a crossboat con shooting contest at an English castle once. I mean, it, it's <laughs> like, you know, I just kind of took what I, what I knew a little bit about, researched a lot and, and recreated an era. You know, it, to a Brit, I may have gotten some things wrong, you know, but I did so much research. I tried to get it right. I tried to make it feel realistic. I did the best I could because I'm not English, but I I think the, the important thing is it's it's a work of fiction. It, it's it's not, you know, real history that I have tried to fictionalize. It's total fiction from a bygone era. And I just think, you know, if it can give people pleasure, that's what I really want. I want people to have pleasure from be, and, and enjoy, entertain them. Some writers go, I want to write the perfect novel. I want to entertain people. You know, that's a really good point, Rick. And I was speaking with Jeffrey Deaver recently, and he was talking about, and he's another gentleman that uh, keeps language softer-ish and violence to a minimum. I mean, real gore. And he was talking about it's he he likes to just create a roller coaster that you're just you know it's it's you're up and it's you're down and you're up. He wants it to be a thrill a minute, and this is kind of what I got from you is that you know you want a little bit of that everyday life, and then holy crap, something's going to yeah. happen, and then it settles back, and then oh my goodness. And I love the fact back to the word nostalgia from the moment I stepped inside your barber shop uh, because I grew up in an era where my dad used to take me to that little building with the red, white, and blue striped pole outside and uh, put me in that chair and put on the cape. And oh, I yeah. That. And, I, and the what I've always liked about barbershops, for instance, and then it's become kind of hip with these different shows on different channels, but is the fact that Everybody comes, everybody is on one level playing field. You can be a, a big politician. You could be a movie star. You could be the garbage man. Everybody is equal. And that's one thing I walked away taking going, this is, these are guys coming from all backgrounds of life. These, this barbershop group of barbershop detectives. And when it's wrapped in that nostalgia, you can't help but like it, you know? I'm glad, I'm glad you feel that way. Yeah. You know, the barbershop has always kind of been a, commu a, a, a community meeting place and, you know, it, it was where people gossip and talk and exchange. Yeah. And, and I, it just felt like a natural environment. I mean, again, it, it just came to me. I saw it in my mind and started writing it, but it, it felt like a, a fun place. And, and I, I'm not familiar with that many books that do take place in barbershops. So I thought it was kind of a little unique. Well, and, and this is going to lead me up to one of the this one of the single biggest reasons I wanted to talk to you, and it's one of the things that jumped off the page to me. It struck a chord. Um, and by the way, happy belated birthday. Me? Wasn't it? Wasn't it just the book dropped in February, right? Or oh, right yes. Book, book birthday, yes. <laughs> book you. birthday, right. Yeah. <laughs> when is your birthday, by the way? I'm curious. My birthday is on July 6th. <laughs> okay, gotcha. Book birthday. All right. Well, um, then you. happy belated birth, book birthday <laughs> to you. Thank you. But here's my bigger point as I screw that up. Um, <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> you're tar turning 77 this year, right? That's, I, am I am 77. Okay, 77. Here's my biggest point. Uh, is the way that you want to inspire others that two part. And I love this. It's never too late to start something new and never stop chasing your dreams. I mean, that's yes. the best. That's the best thing ever. Talk to me about that. Well, I, I have, I have chased the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow my entire life. Some of the ventures have been highly successful. I mean, I, I, was a record producer with a Grammy nomination and things like that. These are all things I did on my own, not with companies I was working for. Um, and then I also had a company that I started where I uh, did a deal with one of the big electronic signs on Times Square, where I put people's names on the, there. So you could like wish your wife happy birthday or something. It was an absolute unmitigated disaster. But, but what I found 
in the course of my life was that the chase was as satisfying and more fun than even finding the pot of gold. And so why stop doing something, no matter how old you are, that is pleasant and that, that keeps you active and that you enjoy? And then I, then I go to the age thing. And, and you know, I, I just think there are people, I, I was going to say too many, I don't know how many, but there are certainly people out there who kind of look as they get older and go, well, I'm too old to do anything. I, I just absolutely don't believe that. I, I just believe you're not too old if you have an idea, if you have a dream, if you have something that you that interests you, go for it. It's like Wayne Gretzky said, and I'm paraphrasing, but Wayne Gretzky, when he was asked how he became the most prolific scorer in history of the National Hockey League, he said, well, I took the most shots. If you don't take a shot, you can't score. And that's kind of been my mantra my whole life. And I'm not about to give it up now just because I'm 77. And, um, you know, and, and, you know, if I didn't do this book, if I didn't do something, nothing would have happened. Right. Nothing's happening. So, wow. I mean, I want to be an example to other seniors that, yeah, if you got a dream, go for it. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. My dad, uh, my listeners have heard this before. It's a theory uh, or a, a saying I live by. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Right. Good. I like that. Yeah. And I'm a big, big fan of just chasing the dream. And, you know, there's plenty of time later to sleep. And I'm all about good health and eating right and get plenty of sleep. But I mean, really, in the big picture, uh, you know, run hard, be put up wet, but enjoy the ride because, uh, you know, we, there may be more, there may be not, I, we could right. spend a whole nother, uh, whole other <laughs> hour on that, but I love it. It's never too late. And, and I appreciate that. The question that I want to lead up to before we head into uh, rapid fire questions is something I ask everyone and it's just kind of classic. And, and I know that you're on the front end of this, so it might be a little bit different. However, Having just heard this prolific, successful career and the way you're approaching this, what I'm calling your next chapter in life, the way I like to call it for myself, is if you could boil it down, you're going to speak to a group of school kids or, you know, retirees, I don't know, but what's the best piece of advice you would give someone? And let's be specific to writers because so many of my listeners are either established traditional or established self-published or up and coming somewhere in between. Can I give you a few pieces of advice rather than just one? Rick, as many as your heart desires. Okay. For, for aspiring authors, I, I would say the following. First, write and keep writing. You know, I, I mean, writers write. So write, right. that, that's number one. Number two, live with rejection. It's going to happen. Don't let it get you down. You know, whether it's an agent turning you down, whether it's the public not liking your book, whether it's a critic, believe in yourself and, and just live with the rejection. Don't let it get to you. Um, I would say another thing is decide what your goal is as a writer. You know, is it what you want as a career or is it what you know, you just enjoy writing and you'll, you'll be happy self-publishing something and you don't really care if anybody reads it or not. Or do you want to be a writer and you need it, you want a traditional publisher and you, you want to make a career? Decide what your goal is. Um, another thing would be uh, if, you, if you do want to be traditionally published and uh, which, you know, by a traditional publisher, you're going to need an agent 99% of the time. And I would say it's very important that you research your agents that you want to submit your manuscript and your query letter to and personalize it. Don't just send out something that's one size fits all, dear agent. You need to know that they represent the genre that you, you know, let them know in your query letter that you know who they are and, and what makes them tick and personalize it to them. Um, and the last thing I would say is, other than write a great query letter, um, the other thing that I would say is, I'm going to deal with writer's block for a minute, because um, I would say, 
two things about writer's block. Number one, if you have writer's block, leave whatever project, consider leaving whatever project you're working on, work on something else and then come back to it and see if it starts clicking or not. The second thing about writer's block is when you go back to it, evaluate whether it's really worth continuing or not, because you may have writer's block because there's nowhere to go with it. On the other hand, it may just be a matter of time before it clicks in your mind where to go with it. That, that's kind of, and lastly, I would say, have fun. Yeah. You know, as a writer, have fun. It, it's, it's, it's a great profession to have fun with. Yeah. That's so, so solid. Thank you so much for that. And you know, it's so funny. I went to Thriller Fest back in 2019 and I got a chance to do that uh, rapid dating, uh, that they speed dating with agents. And, and I took away this, and I'm going to be careful how I say this. I would meet some agents and granted it's a, it's a stressful situation. You got three minutes Oh, yeah. You're trying to boil down your entire book that you've spent anywhere from six months to three years working on. You want to make a good impression. You know that there's a line behind you. It's just rife with oh, yeah. anxiety. Here's one thing I walked away with, though. Consider the fact that, I mean, let's drill drill down on the, fa uh, on the phrase speed dating. If you were to actually go on a speed dating with a in my case would be a woman if I weren't married, I would be, how does I, how do I feel about this person? Do I feel like there's a connection? Do I feel like they get what I'm trying to say? And if you, if your spirit, your intuition says no, well then move on. And I kind of use that same theory, Rick, with rejection. I always figure if there's a stack of no's out there, we'll call it a stack of no's, right. that I've got to get through that stack of no's somehow, somewhere. And if I get a no, well, great. I'm just getting closer to a yes. So great. Cross it off, cross it off. And I don't worry about how many no's I got to go to. I just got to know that there's going to be a yes in there somewhere. If I didn't believe that there was a yes in there, then right. I probably wouldn't do it, you know? Right. No, I, I, I get that. And, you know, yeah. I, I've written two other manuscripts, books, novels in different genres, and they're never going to see the light of day. And, <laughs> and there's probably a good reason why they're not going to. It, it wasn't my forte. But if I had let that stop me, this book never would have happened. Yeah. Well, this is a delightful read. I, you know, I could, I could go down some of these uh, quotes. I mean... Holmes and Poirot, please make room for Pino and Scorpion. Reed Farrell Coleman says on the cover, and there's just one great quote after another, but I wish you huge success. Wow. Yeah, it's just a fun romp. I, if you got just a couple more minutes, yeah, sure. great. We're going to do a little rapid fire questions. It's There's no pressure to it. And we're going to start off with number one. My wife and I, I do this one a lot. My wife and I are throwing a small dinner party to celebrate the ginormous success of your book, Rick. We're that excited. We're going to have you out here to San Diego to party with us because we just love you. We're going to pretend that you're going to that it's right. just skyrocket and you're going to come up to our house for a little party. And what, what I'm getting at is you get to invite three people to this soiree to join in the celebration. They can be living or past. It's just three people that you think, oh, would really bring something to this party. Who would they be and why? First would be my wife. Perfect. Uh, and uh, if on, on many, many levels, including just her absolute brilliance and, and her experience as well uh, in life and, and just my desire to always be with her. Sure. So that, that's one. Uh, off, the, off the top of my head, so I'm not thinking about this. I think the second would be Albert Einstein. I, uh, I, I just uh, a, a brain like that. I want to, uh, I, I want to be around and witness for myself. Yeah. Um, and the third person, who would it be? Maybe Winston Churchill. Oh, excellent. <laughs> The conversation would be rife with theories. <laughs> yes, I, I know. You know, I, and I guess you know, if there was an author in there, maybe it would be Edgar Allan Poe. Okay, uh, but uh, I, I don't know. That that's off the top of my head. That, that's, that's all it's supposed to be. Top of your head. All right, now this one's going to be fun, and I, I have to believe I. 
having known you just a very short while, I've got to believe that I have an idea that this is going to settle very well with you. Hollywood, by the way, great news, has number two here. Hollywood is just optioned and greenlit your novel to be turned into a blockbuster movie. Now, they've asked you to be playing a part in it. And now that I know that you've actually acted before in an episode of Sex and the City, which role would you like to play and why? We're putting this on the screen. Who would you play and why? Okay. (laughs) It's a hard question for me to answer because it's... uh, (sighs) because there's no character in the book as old as me. <laughs> so you, you know, can reverse engineer since it's all daydream play. You can be, you can be, you can be 37 if you'd like to. Oh, okay. Actually, if I could reverse engineer in any way, shape or form, yeah. the character that I would like to be is Thelma Smith. Okay. The, the bookstore owner. <laughs> okay. Well, now you've gone back in time and changed sexes. This, that's boy, no one's ever turned the tables quite like that on me. That's great. Well, I, I, um, I, I would have to say that I, I love her as a character. My, my feminine side with, you know, just came out and I, I just, you know, feel that I, I just bond with her as, as a human being, if you will. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) I love it. All right. Our third and final rapid fire question. And because I know you have such an appreciation for both of these arts, I wonder if given the chance, and you've kind of had your toes in both of them, but given the chance you can have worldwide acclaim as either a musician or as an author, which one, and you had to pick one, which would it be and why? Are we talking about today? Yeah. Today, it would all be- of a sudden, this year, you get to be the biggest fill in the. You get to be the biggest, most celebrated musician in the world, or the most world renowned author. Um, I, I would have to say author, um, and, and and mainly because I I know my I I believe what I'm writing can be accepted by a lot of people. It, it you know and, and is getting great reviews and things. I also know my limitations as a musician. So I, I think that um, I would just, I'd rather be the creator of the word than, than a, a player. You know, I, I mentioned earlier, I'm, I'm working on actually rewriting a bit and uh, re-recording that, that science fiction rock opera. And, you know, so that I would love to be known for because that combines both, but it's not me as a musician, it's more as a songwriter and a writer, but I would say a writer. Nice. Okay. Fair enough. Well, you may have all your dreams come true. The way that I'm watching your career go, you're going to have all your dreams come true, Rick. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the book, Pinion Scorpion. And uh, if you want to know more about Rick, just simply visit Rick Blyweiss at uh, dot com. And you can also follow Rick on Twitter, as I do. Rick Blyweiss and uh, Instagram uh, add author to the end of that. But boy, I'll tell you, I think you're Rick. I feel very confident in saying that you're well on your way and congratulations to you. Thank you, David. I, I got to tell you, I loved this, uh, this conversation we've had today. Thank you so much. Yeah. You've lit me up. I mean, you're bringing, you bring so much to the table and it, it, and at your age, which I completely respect, I think I love the way you see life and the way that you celebrate that. And I and I, I hope people walk away with that more than almost anything else. That don't let the clock direct how you think it should go. You take it the way your heart wants you to go. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well said. Very yes. well said. <laughs> and I and I have to ask out of curiosity. Uh, because I, it's just in me uh, as nature, uh, uh, has to be a series, correct? Well, I've just finished writing the second book. Um, I'm, uh, it's being looked at by my agents right now. It'll be turned into Blackstone in two weeks, and it's scheduled to publish next February. Um, I'm hoping that that does well and there'll be a third because I've already started writing the third, <laughs> but I don't know whether or not, um, whether or not it will, uh, 
it will come to the light or not. I hope so. Um, and by the way, one thing you mentioned about Hollywood, um, there's actually a UK production company now who has optioned the book and nothing's been green lit yet, but uh, I've got my fingers crossed. You never know. Well, it would be perfect for that audience. It would be perfect for all of us, but yeah, I could definitely see it's like in the, what do you call it? PBS or BritBox world, right? right? Yeah. Yeah, the second book, um, there's a, uh, a a young man, a man who is uh, a hot air balloonist and he is killed while alone in the balloon up in the air. There's another murder that takes place where one of uh, Eve, one of the barbers, his clients drops dead in his barber chair. And then there's a, um, a um, blacksmith who is murdered on his way home after birthing some calves. The third book starts out with uh, a young um, Irish magician who is performing a feat in front of Houdini and two other well-known um, magicians of the era. And she is able to be in two places at one time and they can't figure out how she does it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, my gosh. That gives gosh. you a little sneak, sneak peek on what's coming. <laughs> See, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. Right, you did. <laughs> Rick, thank you once again for the gift of your time. So much enjoyed this. Oh, I, me too. Thank you, David. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. And uh, I, I, I just shout out, thank you. <laughs> Thanks again, Rick. That was amazing. What a great time. The book is Pinion Scorpion and the Barbershop Detectives, Rick Blyweiss was my special guest and uh, man, look at this smile on my face. Just so much fun talking about the music industry. That's what I love about this show. I get to meet some of the coolest, most talented people in the business. Yeah, there are all kinds of backgrounds, former military, former secretaries, former music execs, TV execs. Whew, it just goes to show you, it doesn't matter what you've done, as long as you've got the passion for writing, you can do it. And as Rick said in the show, you know what? Go for it. Don't let age be an interrupter. So enjoy that. All right, we got to get out of here. And uh, I'm David Temple, your host. Thank you once again for joining me. And thank you for putting the Thriller Zone on the map as one of the fastest growing podcasts in America. I appreciate it. It's Apple Podcasts. It's Spotify. It's Stitcher. It's iHeartRadio. It's wherever you get your podcast. And of course, on the YouTube channel, youtube.com slash David Temple Author. Thank you once again. We'll see you next time right here on The Thriller Zone.